Okay, everybody, this is Sheets, and Bobby is attending to some, uh, he's doing some very important scouting of, uh, of, uh, of a basketball game, and uh, maybe we'll report on that a little bit later. So I'm going to be doing today's review, very, very small slate. I shouldn't say that small, like five, five gamer, something like that. And I'm going to do DraftKings. I'm going to do FanDuel. And I'm again, again, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm not just going to go game by game. I'm going to kind of look at the whole slate as a whole. And hopefully that will help. I did want to say something um, about GPPs. And again, because I'm doing this on my own, I could kind of just deviate from the usual. As some of you may know, I used to be involved in poker, both in the playing and also in the staking part of poker. So I have a lot of experience when it comes to results and uh, tracking results and successes and failures with respect to uh, events that, that have a wide distribution of results, uh, that being uh, uh, MTTs in poker. For those of you who don't know poker, that the big, the big multi-table <laughs> tournaments of poker. That's what I used to stake people in. And... I wanted to share this with you as a comparison to GPPs in DFS. There are two ways, well, among others, there are two ways to go bankrupt playing uh, MTTs in poker and GPPs in D DFS. And I once did a video for my poker site that kind of highlighted this. I think I call it Fire and Ice. There was an old poem by Robert Frost that basically was suggesting that the world can end one of two ways, either by fire or by ice. And it was a metaphor, okay, but the, the general idea was that it could either go up in flames or it could be like a slow freeze. And to make that analogy to poker and GPPs, one way that you could lose all your money playing poker is playing really way too aggressively, right? Just completely crazy. And you can lose your money and, and lose it pretty quickly. But perhaps the more torturous way to lose money, which I did back people that lost money this way too, was just being way too conservative, you know, not taking enough risks, and slowly but surely bleeding your way into bankruptcy. And that's perhaps the most, the most vicious because it takes a lot more time um, out of your life. And what people would end up doing in poker is they would min cash, they would min cash, they would min cash, and they're getting ninth, then they would bust, then min cash, min cash, ninth, whatever it is. And the way results distribute in the big multi table tournaments in poker just doesn't allow for that style to be profitable. And it just buries you slowly but surely. And likewise with GPPs. Um, I know that a lot of people like to, you know, run optimal lineups and they like to, you know, see what the best plays are and the highest projected plays and play those. If you're playing, this is, this is probably the most important thing that I can tell you. And I know most of you know this already, which is why I'm going to tell you it again, because you could fall into bad habits and fall into bad fundamentals. If you play cash game lineups, in large field GPPs, you are going to go broke. Um, it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but it will be a slow grinding process where you will lose all your money. It's just simply the way results distribute in these types of tournaments with all the prize money up at the top, paying off all the people that are taking the biggest amount of risk you just cannot compete with those lineups on, with any degree of regularity. And the way your results have to distribute in GPPs for you to be a winning GPP player is not min cash, min cash, min cash, min cash, min cash, min cash. It just has to be bus, 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 second. Bus, 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 third. You know what I mean? Bus, bus, bus is the one every so often a winner. You know what I mean? You just can't accomplish that by playing lineups that are too chalky. You just can't. 
And I know what, what it's, it's tempting sometimes when you go say on a losing streak, you know, you lose X amount of times in a row or whatever that you start to, you know, I just got to make quote unquote good plays. I, I, you know, I'm trying to be contrarian, trying to be off the board, but I just got to go back to just making good plays. And what you end up, what people end up doing is just over chalking their lineups, getting a little confidence from a few min caches, but make no mistake that that is a really a one way ticket to this, to nowhere land. It really is. And it's a slow grinding process, which will destroy you, which will destroy you. Um, I, I just can't emphasize that enough. Yet on the other hand, I mean, you don't want to die by fire either, right? You don't want to just play every lineup just ridiculously contrarian because, you know, there is a certain amount of projection integrity you have to stick to, especially in basketball, where the results on an individual player base don't deviate as much as some of the other sports. Okay? And you have to be able to draw, not draw that line, because the line's always blurry, is to attain that mix of good plays that are just maybe not the best plays. And the word best is always relative. You know what I mean? Best plays have to be in your head a combination of good ratios plus good ownership, you know, plus correlation and things like that. So I figured I, I would just take a few minutes to just remind you guys of that. Um, not with this slate particularly, but I just had this, you know, just this was just in my head. All right, so today's slate is a five-game slate. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull up um, – let's pull up the DraftKings and we'll draft the team. And we'll go, we'll go game by game, but I want to give you a, a, uh, an overview on the slate, okay? Because there's a, a decent amount of injury news that has created just a lot of value kind of right off the bat. And – what you're going to do with that value and what, first of all, what, to what extent you're going to play it versus to what extent you're going to fade it. Plus the fact, plus the question of what are you going to do with that value? If in fact you do play it is going to determine, you know, like what, what, what your approach is on the slate and to some extent how you perform on the slate. So Denver last night, they had, um, um, there was doubt whether Jamal Murray was going to play, and Gary Harris was already ruled out. So they, um, uh, Jamal Murray, uh, actually was taken off of the uh, the court. Uh, I wouldn't say on a stretcher, but they were, he was carried off the court. So he's not going to be playing tonight. So the resulting value on Denver is going to be extremely difficult to fade. And the reason for that is in part because, you know, the best player on the team is Jokic. He's a center. And when all of the other people on the team are going to be holding the ball, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's tough for somebody not to get there, you know? So, so the value that's opened up on this Denver side, you know, I'm going to go over who – I'm going to go over what it is and all that stuff. But it's – on a overall level, it's going to be extremely tough to fade. Um, can you pick the right one? Can you fade one of them or two of them? Yeah, possibly. But again, from a, an overall perspective, they're just going to kind of be forced to get there, you know? Um, so I guess we should start by looking at that. If you want to know the truth. Um, so the value guys that are going to be popping on Denver are going to be, and these are all, they're all going to be, owned to some degree, but some more than others. And that could be an interesting point is Michael Porter jr. He is uh, going to rate to be probably the highest owned player on the slate, maybe at 3,600. Um, whether he starts or not, he's going to get the minutes and, you know, he, he rates to be a really good play. He came off a, came off a great game last night also, but I mean, I'll suggest to you that we've heard this before. I mean, he was a lock a week ago. He did nothing. He got benched or whatever. And this is a back-to-back. -back, so he is not, doesn't have to get there. You know what I mean, he doesn't have to smash. Um, you know, weird things happen in back-to-backs, and I just kind of leave you with that. But the thing is that if he doesn't smash, 
just somebody else just kind of has to, you know, Monty Morris is going to be, is going to be starting in the place of Jamal Murray. And he is going to rate as a tremendous play also. Um, you can look at PJ Dozier. He's uh, he's he was the backup point guard last night. Will probably be the backup point guard today, and he's only three K. Um, so he's a guy that's gonna that's gonna be a really you know tough value to kind of to not consider, you know. And then if you want to do something weird, you could play Will Barton, who is not projecting that great in and of himself. But remember, you know he's the second best player on the team now with, you know, behind uh, Jokic. So he's going to be expected to score a lot. So I presume he's going to get a bunch of shots off. So the idea is that you, I don't think you could fade this whole thing. You know, I, I think you have to play either Porter or Morris or Dozier or two of them or three of them or whatever. So the, the idea with this slate is what, what are you going to do with the money that you're saving? You know, and that's always one question you have to ask yourself when you are playing these value plays is, is what are you getting for that? You know what I mean? Like, is, is the fact that you're saving that money going to allow you to do things elsewhere? And today it is a day where it's going to allow you to do things elsewhere. Um, so let, let, let's go back to some other, some other values that have opened up today. And then we're going to go back and see what to do with them. The other values that have opened up is the fact that Kelly Oubre was ruled out. Um, I presume he's ruled out. He's in concussion protocol. Um, Let's just double check that. Yeah, he is out. So that opens up, you know, all these minutes at, at the small forward position, uh, small forward, even a power forward. So Michael Bridges is going to start for him probably, and he's going to be, you know, one of the chalkier options, I, I would think, um, at 4,500. And the other guy who's going to pop is a really good value because he got a lot of minutes last game um, when there was an injury, I think, or even just for no reason is Cam Johnson at 3,100. So he's going to be chalky as well. So the first thing I would, I would ask is, is if you had to think about the differences between these values on the Phoenix side and the values on the Denver side, I think it's important to realize why the players on the Denver side just are just much more secure I won't say secure, but probably a, all else being equal, right? Uh, ownership wise, probably better plays because, you know, Phoenix still has Rubio and Booker and Aiton that are just, you know, gonna, that can carry the load for the team. You know, you, you can't, you, you're not gonna need Michael Bridges to, to carry the load. You're not gonna need Cam Johnson. Where on the other hand, presuming that Murray and Gary Harris are out, you know, you could, I guess, suggest that they run the whole offense through Jokic. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, other guys just have to touch the ball. Other guys have to get rebounds. Other guys have to get off shots. And considering also that Jokic is such an unselfish player that he just loves to get those assists, it's just going to be just too many scoring opportunities for everybody else um, to, to ignore it. So, you know, when it comes to prioritizing, I think that the the Denver value just looks to be just so much better, I think, than the Phoenix value. Now, if the Phoenix value becomes incredibly low owned, which I don't think it will, um, then you could certainly pivot to that a little bit. But I do think the Denver value, just because of the, the, the absence of the point guard, you know, is a really, really, you know, not even just the absence of the point guard, but – the fact that the, the that the rest of the offense will run through Jokic and Jokic will get those assists and stuff like that, these guards are just going to have to be a big big part of this. So um, between Porter and and um, and the other guys that I mentioned, Mont, Monty Morris and uh, what was the other guy, the the backup point guard, uh, Dozier, Tory Craig, he's like a low usage guy. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go for him. So what do you do with that? Okay. Well, let, let's you want to do game by game. Let's go game by game. And what we're going to do is we're going to see, I'm going to highlight the good plays from each game and see how I can prioritize those. Okay. Uh, like for example, I actually made a list of like the guys that I thought were kind of the good plays in general with kind of you know, expected ownership, at least as of now. 
And I put them all up here just to remind myself, and then we'll kind of come back to what to do with them later. Because again, you can get a certain amount of these guys if you use those value plays. And I think, again, if you do use the value plays, it'll let you get more of them. So I think it is important to, to rank these guys, to figure out how you want to play them. So on the Phoenix, in the Phoenix New, uh, New York game, the two plays to me that stand out are going to be um, uh, actually there are three plays. There's going to be uh, DeAndre Ayton. Uh, there's going to be uh, and on the Nick side, there's going to be Julius Randle. Like those are the two main plays from this game. Okay, uh, so again on the Phoenix side, um, what's his name? DeAndre Ayton. Put him at center for now. And on the New York side, Julius Randle. However, there are secondary plays that you can make also. I don't want to say secondary because they're both really, really good plays. And again, if you're trying to stack something, it's always important to try to consider that. You know, um, if, if, you, if you could find good plays from both sides, I would look to that. And – on a slate like this where you could get away with a lot of different things, I wouldn't mind, uh, you know, call it overpay or whatever, but, but, but paying for, for Devin Booker, all right? Um, in, a, in a close game, I could, again, just kind of see this, see this future, you know, of, of, of Randall just trying to take over for the Knicks and, and Booker trying to take over for Phoenix and have those goes run, guys run it back and forth to the point where, you know, in GPPs, if, if Aiton's going to be overly popular and you can get a little lower ownership on Booker because of his price, I might even prefer Booker Randall than, than Aiton, uh, even though the projections are not going to be quite as strong uh, if you go this route from a value perspective. Just because of that, that correlation, that run back thing between these two guys. And um, if you want to then do something else, like if you want to like, kind of overstack the game in a way, you could go, then go to the next level, which to me would be Elf Payton on the Knicks. So, if, for example, if you wanted to do this and you wanted to put in, say, what's this, uh, Ayton, then if you wanted, then you could do stuff like, like Michael Bridges and really make a full stack out of this if you wanted. Or you could then go to something like Cam Johnson. Right. And you still have 5,500 a player. So, see, the point is, is that when you can go about your builds knowing that you have that Denver value available to you, it'll let you, it lets you kind of be very creative about what you do in the earlier games, like in the other games. Like Devin Booker, even though he's technically overpriced, even relative to his salary or whatever it is, I mean, relative to his performance, it doesn't really matter that much when you can, you know, you, when you have the, the upside of a Devin Booker and you can get him in really easily with these other, uh, with these Denver guys, okay? Uh, as far as ownership goes, Aiden was, Aiden and Randall are actually very timid. I mean, one's, Aiden's rated to be only about 10%, Randall only about 15%, and Booker isn't even listed in the top, as 10%. So this is a, probably a decent start, you know? Assuming you play some low, so, some higher owned Denver chalk, you can play a decent Knicks Phoenix stack with some, what could be kind of expensive-ish type players, but it doesn't really matter because you can get them in easy, if that makes any sense. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the Boston is the Boston Milwaukee game. Um, unfortunately, for those of you that want to play Boston guys, it looks like Tatum is going to be in, and if Tatum is in. I, I'm really not interested in anybody on the Boston side of this game. They just don't project all that well. They're gonna they're gonna throw in throw enough. They're gonna throw the kitchen sink at Milwaukee to try to stay in this game. So you know whether it means running six, seven, eight, nine, ten guys at, at Giannis or whatever it is. Um, the problem also with Boston is they are on a back to back, and and where it would have been nice for them to have handled Detroit easily and rest their guys. Turns out it didn't work out that way to the point where I think Jalen Brown is actually considered questionable for this game. Let's just take a look at this. Yeah, well, he played through the thumb sprain, but you want to play a right guy with a right thumb sprain? I'm not too interested. So I really don't like anybody from the Boston side. 
I will say that Milwaukee does give up a bunch of threes. So if you want to take Kemba coming off of a uh, coming off of a bad game, you could you could try him. But then again, Milwaukee's also really good at defending pick and roll. So uh, I'm not. I don't think I'm going to go with a lot of Boston guys. There's just too many better options that you can afford. That you don't need to do this Boston stuff. I don't think on today's slate. So here's the deal with Milwaukee, right? So the one one bit of interesting news with respect to um to DraftKings was that they made Giannis a power forward only eligible, which is going to make him lower owned by definition. You know what I mean? Like if you can only use a guy in let in less, if you can use a guy in less spots than you used to be able to, he's less owned. He will be less owned now than he otherwise would have been, right? Um, and for good reason. I mean, like the, the more flexible you can be with a player, you know, the, the more likely you are to use him. So here's the problem with, with, with fading Giannis in a situation like this. So Giannis is projecting to be, first of all, from a raw points perspective, the highest owned player, excuse me, the highest projecting player on the slate. Um, and he's only projecting to be about 30% owned on a five game slate compared to there's other guys that are like 25 and 30. We'll get to like Ingram and Russell and, Donovan Mitchell and guys like that, who also project really well, but but Giannis projects to be a real a real high uh, raw points guy. His value looks to be pretty good, also, and they're projecting him for about thirty to thirty two minutes, which makes sense. I mean, he hasn't had to play thirty six minutes in a while, um, and when he does, you you know, if you have to if you if you're fading Giannis playing 36, 37 minutes, you got a problem. Uh, it's going to be an issue. So here, here's the, the problem with Giannis, and here's kind of the catch-22. On the one hand, Boston is, is a good defensive team. Um, Brad Stevens is great. They have tricks. I know that they're looking forward to this game. They're looking they, – they're, they've been scheming for this game. They want to stop Giannis. They want to play well. They want to play good defense, Okay. But the problem is, is that the better Boston plays, the better defense they play on Giannis, that just means the closer the game stays, which means Giannis just plays more minutes. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a really difficult situation to fade Giannis, you know, because especially when his projections are based on 32 minutes, because, you know, on the one hand, he could just get his 55 or 60 points in 30 minutes like he has been. or if if Boston does a good enough job to limit him, then he's just going to play more minutes because the game won't blow out. So we'll get those points anyway. So it, it, it seems as though fading Giannis is going to be very, very difficult, um, especially considering his, his ownership is not that bad. And also considering the fact that you can get him in. And as a matter of fact, you could probably get him in with this other stuff. Like if you put, say, we haven't gone to any of these other games yet, but you can even put, say, Randall here. And normally you say, boy, I only got 3,900 player. How are you going to do it? But we've already talked about it. You know, like if you wanted to, and you don't have to do this, but if you wanted to, you could go and play, you know, Morris. And then you still have plenty left for, for um, who was that? Um, where was Michael Porter Jr.? wherever he is, Michael Porter Jr. And then you have the cam at 3,100 and you have, you know what I mean? Like, so there's plenty, there's plenty of room to get him in Giannis and not kill the rest of your lineups. You could play Giannis with a real powerful, you know, Booker Randall, high points, high correlation mini stack and still have plenty of room to get it done because of that Denver value. So. I guess that's all I have from the Milwaukee side. Um, I don't really want anybody else on in this game. So the other way you could go is is the next game. Utah New Orleans is a very attractive game. I mean, it's a, Utah going into New Orleans would be a high paced high paced game. What's his name? Uh, Drew is uh, is out again. So you're going to have some good plays for this game, and those are going to be. Um, let's just review. It's going to be Brandon Ingram. I'm presuming he's playing, right? Brandon Ingram, 
And if you want to go to other New Orleans guys, you could go to like Hart and Favors and Ball, but but they don't project to be that great of a play. And, and you know, playing against Utah is certainly no bargain. And considering how good some other options are, it doesn't seem like you want to do this unless you want to stack the game. So if you go and stack the game, you want to play like Ingram with Ball with with favors or with hard or any of these guys, you can do it because again, you have that Denver value. You know, as a matter of fact, like on the Utah side, you have one guy who might project to be the high, one of the highest owned players just because of his price and just perfect matchup and all this stuff is, is Donovan Mitchell. So Donovan Mitchell is rating to be one of the best, you know, non value plays. You know what I mean? Like non cheap value plays on the slate. Points per dollar perspective, seventy four hundred for him is just it's just as they would say too cheap, you know. And given this matchup and the fact that it would probably be a close spread and all this stuff, um, makes for a very 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 good play. I personally hate playing Donovan Mitchell. He never seems to want to take over the game when you feel as though he should. So for me, whenever you have Donovan Mitchell, who's going to be high owned, uh, it's going to be my intention to fade him. Not because I don't like him, not because I don't think he's a good play, but again, just because of what I know about him, that he doesn't have that just that kind of extra upside that like some of these guys like Booker and Lillard and Levine and guys like that have that just have it in them and Randall just take over games. Um, you know, given the fact he's going to be extremely highly owned, maybe 30, 25, 30%, um, I don't know if I'm going to do it. But again, if you wanted to, if you, you could certainly afford to go even a Mitchell – with Ingram, as you see, and still play Giannis because you have room for all these, you have all this Denver value that makes this all work out. But again, if you're going to play the Denver value, which is going to be chalky, you just can't play the chalkiest rest, chalkiest places in the rest of your lineup. So I don't think I'm going to do a Mitchell Ingram, right? With those guys. Like if you, if I went and did a Mitchell Ingram, that's where I'd have to do something like fade Porter uh, and or fade Morris, but then again, fading both of them just seems like seems like a grim situation, you know. And then, what are you going to do if you fade them? Where are you going to go? You're going to go, you know, play. You want to pay up a little bit. You want to go to the Phoenix value. You can do that, but you're not getting any real bargain there as far as ownership either. So, um, I just don't think that that the Mitchell Ingram thing, which which on its face makes a lot of sense. Uh, from a projection perspective and the fact that they, they play against each other and what might be a, you know, good high correlation type situation. Uh, I, I think the presence of the other chalk that is kind of hard to get away from makes it makes going to them in a GPP kind of like, you know, playing really conservative poker in, uh, in, in multi-table tournaments. If that analogy rings a little bit at least. Um, okay, so what you could also do if you wanted to pivot off of, the val off of the Denver value in another way is you could wait and see what happens in Orlando because last night what happened is um, uh, Evan Fournier was ruled out and while Terrence Ross became or was always going to be a good play, Markel Fultz went off, okay? Um, he scored, what is it, 47, 45, 50 fantasy points or something like that. And he, uh, you know, he had, has, he had a triple double. Now for me, uh, that's, I'm not, I'm not that guy. Like I'm not going to play, I'm not going to play a guy who played in Los Angeles, had a career game, went out last night, coming back to LA on a back to back. You know, I'm just not doing it. I just, I just, and again, this is um, might not be the greatest math decision in the world. It might not be based on data, but I'm just, I just don't, I'm just not going to fall for that. You know, and and with that said, he might, he might do it again. And if Fournier is out again, he might be a good play again. But I just feel as though that the ownership will will flock to him if that's the case. And I just feel as though. Playing, playing him on a back-to-back -back off of a career game is just not, it's just not something that I'm going to do. I have no data to support that, but that's just not what I'm going to do. Um, if you want to really do something nasty, okay, 
and you might you might hear a little bit about this is boy can i do this well if you want to do you want to pivot off of some of these value guys you can play west of Wundu right, if you want now keep in mind same thing right he's just coming off of a really really good game he had 19 real life points 30 fantasy points which if you got that today would be incredible um and he's had a couple of 20s in there also and what you are going to hear is the same thing that I just told you about about about, uh, about Fultz. I'm not full off of this. I'm not playing a Wundu off of his best game. But what's the difference? The difference is a Wundu is not going to be owned and Fultz is. So, and, and there's also it's not exactly a direct pivot from Fultz that you have to get away from where if you want to get away from Cam Johnson or something like that or, 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 or Porter or something like that, you can play Wes Wundu. Now, again, that's, that's really high variance, and he could certainly get you 10. Um, but again, depends on the rest of your lineup. If you, here's a good example. If you want to play Mitchell and Ingram, that's when you can go play a window. Right. Um, the other, did I put Vooch as a possible play here? I did see, I put Vooch as a possible play in here. He's not rates, doesn't rate to be that great a play, but I, I, he's kind of like that group of 10 and you see, I listed them here that all look close enough to one another that I, I can make concessions. And if he's going to be low owned, I might try him. Um, speaking of that, the other side of this game could be another sneaky way to call it sneaky is kind of ridiculous, but a sneaky way to play without having to play Mitchell and Ingram and guys like that or Aiden, if Aiden becomes very popular. So, you have Kawhi Leonard, who projects to be honestly just as good of a play from a value perspective as um, as uh, as Mitchell, and he is projected to be about ten percent owned. And the reason why he's ten percent owned is they just kind of factor in all this blowout risk all the time with him. Um, but you know, and Orlando is on a back to back, so a certain amount of that is real. But this is also a raw points game, so if you can get 50 points out of him at 10-1, maybe at 10% ownership, that's a good floor to start with, right? To say 50 is kind of a floor is kind of, kind of obscene. I mean, Orlando does play pretty good defense. I'm kind of throwing it out there as an idea. Or you could go play Lou Williams. Again, on this slate, you're going to find that playing guys like this is actually a little gross, you know, like when you see the difference between these guys and playing a real kind of cool matchup between, you know, Mitchell and Ingram and, you know, the stackability of that game, or even, you know, trying to play this Milwaukee Boston thing, or let's face it, the Phoenix, New York game could be just, you know, just as interesting is I don't know how many people are going to play these Clippers. I, I, I don't. And, and Kawhi is, has, has quietly, he is quietly, without even being pushed, just been smashing. You know, in, in his last game, he had 60 fantasy points in 29 minutes. All right. So the problem is, is his projection. They're projecting it at 34 minutes. So it's not like they're projecting at 30. Um, so I think he's fine. Again, I'm just looking for different approaches. I still like the Phoenix, New York thing a little bit better. Um, but if you wanted to play something crazy like, Instead of, oof, instead of playing Booker and Randall and that, that crew, what if you played, instead of Aiton, you went to Vooch, okay? And instead of Booker, you went to Kawhi, for example, okay? Well, you can still do this. You can still do this with Giannis also, if you wanted to. Because you can then get where, what's Cam Johnson's uh, position? Probably put him in somewhere, right? Okay. Um, or you could put him somewhere else. You could put Bridges in here somewhere. So, again, all this value just kind of allows you to do pretty much whatever you want. So, if you wanted to play like Vooch and, and Leonard, that – that could be a pretty contrarian way to go. You know what I mean? As opposed to people that are going to be playing, like I said, the Booker and Randall or something like that. But even Booker and Randall don't look to be that highly owned. So 
I, I guess this, the, 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 the one to avoid, at least what I'm looking at, is this Utah-New Orleans thing. Which again, it's tough. It's a tough avoid. You know, New Orleans plays high pace, and you know where you know where the use is going, especially with Drew out. You know, it's going to be Ingram, to some degree ball, and then on the Utah side, it's going to be Mitchell. Right, he's going to be that guy. You know, if you wanted to play Bojan Bogdanovic in that game, you could do that. But this could be an interesting way to go to go the Kawhi Vooch route, which looks really gross when you just put it in your lineup. But um, you know, you got to be a little bit uncomfortable when you put in these MTTs. And you see what I'm doing? These GPP lineups. All right, so the only guy we didn't really talk about on the Denver side is going to be Jokic. Um, and, you know, far be it for me to tell you to fade him. You know, remember what I said, like, two different in, – in a lot of different ways. You know, the fact that Jamal Murray is out, it very well could be that what Denver does is just run everything through Jokic, Okay. And while Jokic is typically an unselfish player, you know, this is, this is these are GPPs. If, if, if he were not unselfish, let's just say that he decided he wanted to take over this game with, let's just say it's not going well for like a little while. I mean, he could, he can get 80 fantasy points, right? And if every time they throw that ball down to him, instead of just kicking it out to these secondary guys for shots, he's decided to just take whoever they want to guard him with on Golden State, just right to the rack. I mean, he could do whatever he wanted here, right? I mean, is he concerned about Omari Spellman defense, you know, or Willie Colley Stein? Although, you know, Willie Colley Stein's improved, whatever. Um, or they're going to put they're going to put Draymond Green on him or something like that. I mean, he's going to he's going to obliterate people if he wants to, and if he needs to. I don't know. I think with Jamal out, maybe he will need to. You know, they are on the road. I mean, it's not like they're a big favorite or anything like that. They're a four point favorite. Maybe that maybe that's what you do. Maybe you just take Jokic alongside with these Denver values, and then if you want, I mean, this could be a little chalky, but then you could run it back with another really really strong play, okay? Which is Jamal Murray, okay? Uh, not Jamal Murray, uh, D'Angelo Russell. Now D'Angelo Russell is going to be pretty highly owned. He's going to be one of those twenty twenty five percent guys. But again, how highly owned is Jokic going to be? I don't think that highly owned. I think that. You could do this. You could play Porter, Jokic, and Morris, run it back with Russell, and you could, st- you could still put Giannis in, uh, easily if you want to know the truth. So that could be another way to attack this. Uh, what else on Golden State? Um, ooh, you want a narrative? Okay, I'll give you a narrative. You want someone to put in your stacks? I'll give you someone to put in your stacks. Damian Lee just signed an extension or signed something. So you want to do this? Let's go ahead. You can do this. Play Russell with Lee and then have Porter, Chalk, Morris, Chalk, Jokic, Lowon, Giannis. Then you got Cam Johnson. You don't even need Cam Johnson in this build. You know what I mean? Like you can do this if you want to. You're still fading Mitchell. You're still fading Ingram, okay? You're fading Aiden. It might be popular. So, again, this is – uh, is yet another way to attack this. But I feel as though, and I guess this is the wrap-up, I feel as though that you do need specific ways to attack this. In other words, I don't think that it's going to work to do this. All right? For example, let's pull these up. Like, who are the best plays? Let me just see who are the best plays. What if you put in um, Donovan, uh, what's his name? Who would we say? D'Angelo Russell, right? Let's say you put in D'Angelo Russell. And then let's say you put in Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell. He's one of the best players. Let's put it, say you put in Ingram. Let's say you put in Ingram. Let's say you put in – can you put in Giannis still? Yeah, let's say you just put in Giannis, all right? And then he went and said, all right, let's go then go these – put in these values. Let's go put in – Porter, let's put in Morris, let's put in Cam, and then just find some center to put in or something like that. Like, let's say we played, um, uh, just for example, okay, what we call Stein or something like that. 
this is not going to be good enough. You know what I mean? This is too chalky. And it's not only that it's too chalky, there's, 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 there's very little, you know, little, very little oomph to it. You know what I mean? Like, like there's very little huge upside to this aside from the fact that these are good plays and, and being good plays in and of themselves are not enough, not enough. You need to have the correlation here is actually not bad with this lineup. If you want to know the truth. Um, but the combination that's being too chalky overall um, with, you know, not having enough kind of concentration, I guess that's what I can describe it um, makes just kind of making the best plays on a slate like this, just not really the way to win. If you want to know the truth, I think that you would need to take, a, I don't want to say take necessarily take stands, but you could take specific builds. Like you could do what I did say, you know what, one way I'm going to use Denver guys is I'm going to use, I'm going to do, I'm going to go after the Orlando Clipper game. We know it's going to be low owned. I'm going to go Vooch and I'm going to go with, with, with Kawhi. And then what you could do, if you want to not play Porter at 55%, you want to go up to Michael Bridges. Okay, that's fine. But I do feel as though you can't fade all of the Denvers. I do feel as though if you are going to play, if you're going to fade Porter, you've got to play. I don't say you have to, but I think you should play um, one of those other guys that we talked about, either Morris or um, I forget who else. But uh, or you could even play Will Barton. That, 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 that's something you could do. If you don't want to go down the really, really cheap guys, you could pay up for Will Barton. Maybe that's the way to be contrarian there. But P.J. Dozier will probably rate to get minutes and, and be in good shape. Even Maybe Jeremy Grant, whatever. But I just feel as though fading the whole, all the Denver value is going to be just kind of rough business. But so again, same approach. The MTTs, the MTTs, I'm doing it, GPPs, is when you're trying to beat all these people, you can be chalky, but not that chalky. You could be contrarian, but not be that contrarian. Like, for example, I could make a wild contrarian lineup here that, that I can make a case that's going to win that it just won't. You know what I mean? Like I can, I can fade all of the value on the slate and make like a cool looking lineup with, 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 with taking Jokic and taking Giannis and then middle of the ground with, you know, I don't know, you want to go contrarian a little bit, go back to Fournier if he plays or something like that. I don't know. In any case, the fact is that on a slate like this, I think that you have to respect the value where it is, respect the chalk where it is, and don't respect it where, where it isn't. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm not respecting the Mitchell Ingram job. That's what I'm not doing. I mean, I'm respecting it, but I think there's good enough options that I can fade it. Like, you can give me Booker at kind of a shitty projection over Mitchell literally every – not literally every time, but, but most of the time, given the, 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 um, the gap in ownership. Uh, that, that's just, to me – a, a good example of what you're supposed to do in GDPs is play someone like Booker over someone like Mitchell. Play someone like Randall over someone like, you know, Brandon Ingram or something like that. Maybe not as obvious a play, maybe not as, as good of a play, but, I, but again, that upside, that kind of extra ceiling potential, uh, I, I feel as though is worth it. And, and the lower ownership certainly makes it worth it. And going back to the beginning, the Booker-Randall, you know, uh, mini stack, really makes it worth it. Here's, here's like a lineup that I just kind of put in um, just for the hell of it. Again, because I'm not charging and I don't care. I can just kind of show you. And this not, might not be where it is at the end. But here is nothing nothing fancy, right? I'm using Morris. I'm using Cam. I'm using Bridge. But what I'm doing in Porter, but I'm stacking Booker and Randall and Peyton and Bridges. How many people are really doing that in the same game? And I still get to use Giannis. So this in and of itself – you know, nothing particularly off the board here, but this kind of combination, you know, that fades Mitchell and fades, you know, some of the other guys we talked about, fades D'Angelo Russell. It provides, a, you know, some degree of leverage and a really, really strong amount of correlation where something like this, and I, this probably won't end up going in. Um, maybe it will. Uh, so that's where I'm at. I'm going to come back and do FanDuel in a bit, and uh, that'll do it.